Hello, I'm Rachel Hayes Harb. I'm a professor of linguistics and associate dean of undergraduate studies at the University of Utah. I also serve as director of the University of Utah's Office of Undergraduate Research. I'll start with a visual description. I'm a white woman in my 40s with graying blonde hair. I'm wearing a green sweater and I'm standing in front of a white background. I'm coming to you from Salt Lake City, Utah, which is in the unceded territory of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. I invite everyone watching this video to take a moment today to reflect on the history of the lands you inhabit, on how systemic privilege allows you to live and work on these lands, and how you can help to right the historic wrongs associated with stolen land. I'm going to talk to you about a course that I've been teaching in my department. It's the capstone course for the linguistics undergraduate major, and I've been teaching it for the last couple of years as a course focused on reproducibility. We know that scholarly disciplines vary in the degree to which their members have embraced reproducibility and also in the availability of resources for educating new scholars in reproducible research. So what I hope to do is present what could serve as a framework for others possibly in developing their own reproducibility focused undergraduate courses. And my hope is that this is a model that can be used across disciplines where maybe there aren't resources already available. Here you can see a photo of some of the students in a past version of this course. Um, they are talking about one of the replication projects that they've completed. Um, and of course I'm using this photo with my students' permission. Why do I spend precious time within our undergraduate curriculum on reproducibility education? Uh, there's actually several reasons why I think this is really important. First, of course, we all know it's an opportunity for us to address one of the culture problems in science. When we embed the development of research skills and sensibilities within responsible conduct of research and open science values, we actually make reproducibility part of how students think about research from the start. And when we think about the challenge of institutional change around open science, one of my goals is to prepare these students to enter graduate programs, if that's where they're headed, presupposing that their mentors and others are going to be practicing open reproducible science, and they are thus exerting pressure of a particular kind on our colleagues to adopt these practices. I also believe that one of my responsibilities is to promote public trust and productive skepticism in science by demystifying the work of scientists, by acknowledging that my classroom, my lab, my institution, we're all accountable to our students and to the public, and by demonstrating to students that they actually bring value to the research enterprise of my institution. And related to this, I believe that undergraduate research experiences should be authentic whenever possible. So reproducibility provides a philosophical context for researchers in the very earliest stages of their careers to engage authentically at the cutting edge of knowledge in their fields. There are also practical advantages to replication. They provide direct and fast routes to impactful research questions. Uh, the methods are already worked out. Oftentimes the materials are readily available. And depending on the study that's replicated, they might be doable uh, mentorable at scale in the context of a classroom and in a way that would be more difficult to mentor original research studies by each student. And finally, conducting a replication study as an undergraduate student can be an exciting culminating experience for students. So I'm going to go into how this works. Uh, first, a little bit about the course. The capstone course is required for the linguistics major in my department. There is no prerequisite statistics or quantitative analysis coursework. Some of the students, but not all, have prior exposure to experimental work in linguistics. So I'm working with students who may or may not have had any exposure to quantitative or experimental work or thinking in the past. There's approximately 20 students each semester in this three credit hour course. And I've taught this capstone course twice now uh, with a focus on reproducibility. But right now, I'm going to focus more on uh, the more recent instantiation of the course, where I uh, selected uh, in fall 2020 um, for an entirely online asynchronous version of the course a paper by Rubin1992 on reverse linguistic stereotyping. I'll talk about those details in a second. 
Um, but we also were able to invite Ruben and a collaborator to give a virtual colloquium in our department at the end of the semester, which was an exciting bonus for us. I'll give a brief introduction to the selected study and why I chose it. The Rubin 92 Reverse Linguistic Stereotyping Study demonstrated that native English speaking undergraduate students score higher on a listening comprehension test after hearing a recorded lecture accompanied by a photo of a speaker that they perceive to be white or Caucasian uh, rather than hearing that same exact recording accompanied by a photo of a speaker that they perceive to be Asian looking. It's a classic example of how listeners impose their biases on the perception of speech. It helpfully complicates our understanding of speech perception and speech intelligibility um, and is a topic um, that is timely and of interest to students right now. I chose the study for several additional reasons. One is it has a simple design, very straightforward methods, uh, and it was readily uh, transferable to an online implementation uh, in a way that um, students would be able to learn how to do uh, very quickly. The study materials were made available by the author, and so we weren't in a position where we needed to develop study materials. Uh, the study is impactful, often cited in the field, and therefore an important one to confirm. And of course, the topic is of interest to a broad, broad range of students. Um, students who are interested in things like phonetics, phonology, sociolinguistics, education, um, and many other topics. So we can think about the structure of the course in about four phases. The first is uh, a phase on the responsible conduct of research. We begin the class with an exploration of the arguments for and against open and reproducible science. And we consider sources and arguments from uh, both within our field and outside of our field. You can see here uh, the cover of a book called Doing Applica Replication Research in Applied Linguistics uh, by Porta McManus. Um, this is a book that provides a um, great introduction to um, the philosophical underpinnings of uh, reproducibility. And um, we also consider work that's published in popular media. Um, so we consider the debate from a number of angles. Um, and for many students, this is the first time they've been exposed to issues of the responsible conduct of research in general. And so uh, we talk uh, quite a lot about um, a number of RCR topics. Um, so we talk about the ethical involvement of humans as research participants. Um, we talk also about um, responsible data management and record keeping. I make the case that it's important for good science, but it also uh, prevents um, heartache and wasted time in the future. We talk about the ethical obligation of researchers to disseminate their work to both specialist and non-specialist audiences. And finally, we embed our work within our responsibilities as humans, right, and as scholars, um, and our obligation to work towards a just society with transparent and reproducible research as ideals in this regard. The next phase of the course involves skills development. Uh, it's important to start off that students have uh, strong skills in consuming the literature. And so we talk about how to access and select the relevant literature. And we use an article dissection template. You can see a screenshot of it here. And I should note that the materials I'm showing are also available through a link I'll talk about at the end to uh, Open Science Framework. So at this early stage in their research careers, the dissection template is intended to introduce them to the structure of experimental papers in the field. And it's customized in this case to the Rubin 1992 study in that I ask specific questions in it to guide students in extracting the essential details from the article that they're going to need to think about in order to do their replications. And at this point, we tend to alternate between class lectures on the purpose of each section of an article and the dissection of that section. And um, then we engage in a certain amount of discussion and peer review uh, around that work. Next in skills develop development, we cover uh, research collaboration. So group work can be terrifying for some students and with good reason. Collaboration can be challenging 
And the ability to work collaboratively is a skill that many of us have never had the opportunity to develop and explore in a thoughtful and systematic way. I work in a field or a subfield of linguistics that's dominated by collaborative work. I see accountability to collaborators in addition to the ability to bounce ideas off of my collaborators as crucial to my own practice of responsible science. And so I spend quite a lot of time working with my students on their research collaboration skills. We talk about topics like setting expectations of oneself and others, uh, how to approach difficult conversations, and how to create and use a tool um, that I've developed and that they further develop for their purposes um, called a collaboration accountability assessment. The students uh, complete a number of assignments where they interview each other, they reflect on their own styles and preferences, and they develop this rubric then that details mutual expectations around parameters. And these parameters include things like response time, availability to work on the project, uh, documentation and data management, how to handle mistakes, how to be open to feedback, uh, and commitment to the responsible conduct of research. And then once the students end up in their collaborative groups, um, which by the way happens through a combination of self-selection and random assignment, uh, groups then set expectations associated with each parameter, and then they complete the accountability assessment both for themselves, where they're rating themselves, and for their collaborators uh, at multiple times over the course of the rest of the semester. And this is how we keep track of the uh, progress of the study. This is how we keep track of the um, relationships among the collaborators, and uh, we can head off challenges uh, before they become a big deal. All right, so um, there's also, I mean, there's a whole bunch of other um, kind of smaller skills that our students need to develop. Um, and um, we cover technical skills like um, the use of online behavioral data collection platforms. And so in this particular instance, um, I helped them develop their skills with respect to Qualtrics um, so that they could implement the study in that platform. Um, they have to do a small amount of extra coding in order to make the study work the way uh, that it needs to. Uh, and also, I mentioned that students are unlikely to have a uh, robust background in quantitative analysis. And so uh, we cover uh, the use of spreadsheets for computation and to create figures. And then we do a certain amount of work um, talking about the important differences between descriptive and inferential statistics. So uh, this helps them become more responsible consumers of the literature, and it also ends up being important to the ways that they report the data they find in their studies. And then finally, we have skills development around uh, what I call the bazillions of choices challenge. Um, so once we've completed the article dissections and begun to explore the tools and details for conducting our own replications, students are increasingly sensitive to this bazillions of choices challenge. Basically, they're coming to understand that there's no such thing as an exact replication but that some kinds of deviation from the original are likely to matter more than others. And so we talk about uh, a bunch of different examples of deviations and uh, why they may or may not matter. Uh, so one example I like is uh, for a study that involves written directions presented to participants, um, what size font and what font did the authors use? Did that get reported in the study? Um, and why or why didn't it get reported in the study? And then if it didn't get reported, how will you decide what font to use in your study? Uh, and does it matter? And students uh, seem to enjoy engaging with this because it allows them to express their exasperation with the, the challenge of figuring out how to actually uh, engage with a very systematic and careful and well-documented version of their own study. Uh, they find that um, very many of the bazillions of choices that researchers make don't actually get documented in an article. And part of what it's important to me that they learn at this point 
is that some of those things don't get documented because they are standardized across the field and they're implied, except when they're not documented in a specific article, uh, what students need to do is make inferences across articles about um, what exactly the field tends to do in these cases. Um, I like uh, this exercise because um, what they begin to do is develop these sensibilities uh, that actually drive a desire on their part to be transparent in their own work. And so on the one hand, there's a certain amount of them becoming familiar with a field by recognizing which pieces uh, of information, what details with respect to methodology are going to end up getting written into articles, and which ones are generally assumed um, but not stated in the articles, uh, which ones matter to the method, which ones are not likely to matter, and how to make arguments that distinguish between those scenarios. Uh, so an example um, on perhaps the other end of the spectrum would be um, how might the original author's participant sample of convenience differ from your participant sample of con convenience um, and what are the potential impacts of those differences. And so um, we explore um, a variety of the types of choices students need to end up making. Um, and again, they become really, really good at this, right? They're good at identifying all of the choices that they're forced to make that they're not necessarily given explicit guidance on from the uh, author of the original article. And that's actually the point, right? The goal is for them to become so sensitive to the need to make all of these choices that they end up practicing even more transparent and reproducible science themselves. In the next phase, students conduct their replication studies. They learn to maintain detailed study protocol documents where they turn, they start off by translating the methods section from their article dissection into a set of instructions for themselves as researchers, the protocol for their study. And uh, I challenge them at this stage to document every single decision that they make, no matter how small. And these documents can actually get quite detailed and quite long. At this point, I provide step-by-step -step technical directions for the study set up in Qualtrics, right? So they've developed a, a skill set around Qualtrics, and now I'm going to provide them with some specific um, steps that they need to take in order to set things up. Um, I'm not as concerned at this point about their Qualtrics skill set as I am about them thinking through the scientific consequences of all of the decisions that they're making. When they believe they're ready, they collect pilot data, data from friends and family. And this is an exciting and humbling moment for students, um, a lot of fun for me. Uh, I allow for a huge amount of variation at this point. Uh, students discover the often unintended consequences of the many decisions that they have made. And by this point, they have developed sensibilities that let them collaboratively identify and address issues. Uh, I, ex I encourage them to explore when they disagree with their collaborators on how to solve a problem. Um, and because I'm tracking their teamwork all along via the uh, collaboration accountability assessments, I can also step in to offer advice or challenging questions to help them navigate uh, conflicting opinions about what needs to be done. So they adjust their studies accordingly. They record changes and rationales for these changes in the study protocol. They repeat the piloting process as needed, and then they continue on to their final data collection. I should note that up to now, it hasn't been practical in this course to pursue Human Subjects Board approval for students' projects. They do complete our university's human subjects training at the beginning of the semester, and they ensure the informed consent of their participants who are recruited through their social networks. Uh, but because these projects are not disseminated beyond the bounds of our university's presentation events, they're not subject to review by the Human Subjects Board at this time. Uh, but this is something I would like to think about in the future, figuring out a practical way within the time constraints of the semester to make this happen. All right, so in this phase, um, I provide students who are unlikely to have had extensive statistics experiment experience with step-by-step -step data organization and analysis directions. Uh, we don't conduct analyses presented in the original article because we don't have time during the semester to develop the necessary stats expertise. 
but the pattern the pattern of interest is actually readily visible in the descriptive statistics and I teach them how to present those descriptive statistics in a responsible manner. The final phase of the course involves the dissemination and reflection. Again, because so much of what we do in class is new to students and we have so little time, I provide a template and detailed instructions for them to prepare a poster and a poster presentation. I work with each group individually to polish the poster and the three minute oral presentation of the poster. And uh, instead of submitting them to me directly in the class, they actually submit them to the University of Utah's undergraduate symposium at the end of the semester. Uh, which is a forum for undergraduate students to present their work to non-specialist audiences. And you can see an example of one of the group's posters here. They also prepare a final paper. Again, this is heavily scripted so as to be doable within the confines of the semester. Over the course of approximately the second half of the semester, uh, students are writing each article section as assignments. And so by the end of the semester, all they really need to do is compile the pieces, edit, and then turn it in. In view of the focus on collaboration in the class, and also because more and more journals are requiring authors to make transparent their relative contributions to articles, uh, students accompanied their final papers with statements of their contributions. And these are fascinating to read. Uh, uh, the accountability measures that students have been taking throughout the semester seem to actually provide the groups with shared vocabularies for talking about their individual contributions. And the students appeared to be generally in agreement and also realistic regarding how uh, they each contributed to the projects. Okay, so I'm gonna end with a discussion of some of the uh, challenges and considerations and potential future directions for this course. Uh, as I said before, I think it's important for us to embed replication research within uh, a number of obligations that we have as scholars to openness in science, um, to um, public discourse, and to public good. And so we talk about um, the replication research and um, the skills development always within the context of our commitment to justice and equity, um, but also this idea that we should all have access to scholarship um, and further the agency of the undergraduate students in the creation of knowledge in the context of uh, the university research setting. Uh, one of the um, most important choices you make in a class like this is what study the students will be replicating. Uh, I can tell you that in fall 2019, uh, in an effort to give my students uh, maximal choice, I selected three studies uh, that they could choose from. So each group selected one of three studies. Um, this turned out to be unwieldy, and it was unwieldy in part because it was really hard for me to keep track uh, in the really detailed way I needed to of all of the specifics of all of the studies so that I could provide the feedback that the students needed. Um, but it also meant that so few groups were doing each study that there was little opportunity for groups to support each other uh, in the context of the class in developing these projects. And so in fall 2020, I selected one study and that was perfect. Um, I was able to keep track of all of the details. Students were able to, uh, students were able to provide uh, feedback to other groups of students on their work. Um, they were able to um, share ideas about how they had solved various problems, uh, and uh, it made for a real, it made for an environment where there was not just collaboration within the groups, but there was collaboration between the groups. Uh, another consideration is always finding a study where you've got study-related materials that are available. Um, if they're difficult to make, you definitely want to use ones that are already available. Um, you want methods, of course, that are easy to implement um, and are appropriate to the preparation of the students and the time frame of the class. Uh, and then there's always the, um, the question of human subjects board considerations. So uh, what what are the methods? Are they methods that are going to raise human subjects board concerns? Are they ones where um, you can actually conduct a study 
uh, reasonably? Um, are you going to need to pursue um, a IRB approval and how long is that likely to take? Um, there are a whole bunch of considerations around there that um, I think can also uh, impose limits on which studies are going to be the right ones to use in this context. Then there's the question of descriptive versus inferential statistics. Depending on the preparation of students coming into a course like this, uh, it may or may not be realistic to expect students to be able to do all the things they need to do and also learn to conduct the inferential statistical analyses that are necessary. Um, it may make more sense to select a study where, uh, like this one, uh, the, the, the main finding is actually quite um, easy to observe and understand in terms of descriptive statistics. There's also um, the question of whether or not it's possible to interact with the original or maybe even previous replication authors. Um, one of the most exciting things that happened over the course of the semester was that the students were able to uh, talk with the um, author Donald Rubin um, in the context of a colloquium um, and also with a collaborator of his, Okim Kang, um, who also spoke to our students. Uh, the students had uh, remarkably interesting and sophisticated questions for the authors because they were so uh, knowledgeable uh, and curious about the studies um, that the authors had done. Um, I can see huge potential value in uh, using your own research for the replication content for students. Um, in my case, that's not, that's not immediately practical. Um, I needed a method that um, could be implemented um, uh, more easily in an online setting. Um, but I think that this idea of being able to engage with the original author of the study and to pick their brain and have that be part, have, have the scholarly discourse be part of the, the ways students work through the replication study uh, is, uh, is something to keep in mind and to aim for. Uh, I would encourage everyone uh, to um, think carefully about the value of um, intentional development of collaboration skills by students. Um, I upped my game this past semester in light of the fact that the course was asynchronous and online, um, and I was concerned about um, what collaboration would look like under that, those circumstances. And it turns out that all of the things that I did in order to enhance their collaboration skills and to hold them accountable for them are things that I'm pretty sure I'm going to continue doing in the future. Um, I think that intentional development of collaboration skills actually really drives home a lot of the messages that we want students to get around the responsible conduct of research. Uh, there's also the interesting challenge of students' desire to innovate. Uh, so the line, of course, between a replication and an extension is a fine one. And um, students are um, so creative and so interested. And when they become empowered um, with the knowledge that they themselves can engage as scholars in meaningful ways, what they want to do is ask new questions. And so I found it challenging um, to convince students to focus their efforts for now on the replication itself um, in advance, right, in preparation for um, potential extension research in the future. Um, but, but that line between replication and extension being the fine one it is um, actually ended up being a lot of what we would talk about um, in the course. Um, students were really interested in, um, in understanding the consequences of all of those bazillions of choices they needed to make and um, when that turned into a new study versus a replication. Uh, there's also um, the question of whether it would be useful or interesting to pool data across students or groups of students who've collected data. Um, this, of course, interacts with the IRB. Um, you would definitely want to know um, that uh, you had human subjects board approval if you were going to pool data for the purpose, say, of disseminating more broadly than the confines of your university. Um, but uh, this is an intriguing possibility um, that um, certainly there are models for this in some other fields, and I find this really interesting. Uh, 
a challenge that came up that I didn't anticipate was given that this is a course for students who are at the end of their degree programs. Um, many of the students are, of course, applying for graduate programs, but those graduate programs will very often require single authored writing samples as part of the graduate application. So while students naturally will want to include a paper that they have written in their culminating course, their capstone course, as part as, as an example of their best work, uh, it actually turned out that some of the students weren't able to use this co-authored paper in that way. And so I worked with the students that this affected and we found solutions to it. Um, but I find it, I, I, I find it interesting and an, an interesting expression of our values um, that um, we value collaboration but we still want single authored papers as parts of graduate applications um, for obvious reasons, right? The, the rationale for that is clear and reasonable. Um, but it makes me think about what we're, what, where our values are and what we are prioritizing when we do that. Um, finally, I wanna mention that we collaborated with the Office of Undergraduate Research. Like I said before, the students presented their final, their posters at um, the university-wide symposium but our Office of Undergraduate Research also conducts a uh, learning outcomes assessment at the symposium on all of the posters that are presented there. And so we partnered with them um, to get independent assessments of the posters um, on seven undergraduate research learning outcomes. And um, what the Office of Undergraduate Research does is involves uh, graduate students, postdocs, staff, and faculty to serve as independent raters using a rubric um, of poster presentations at the symposium. And we end up with this rich uh, data, um, several, several rubrics completed for each poster um, and um, that, from non-conflicted reviewers. So we have processes for random assignments of um, raters to, to posters. Um, and ways of working around um, conflicts of interest. Um, and so we have this really rich data now um, uh, on how our students are performing after this course with respect to these campus-wide undergraduate research learning outcomes. And I would encourage my colleagues to explore the uh, possibility of similar partnerships at other institutions as well. So I want to thank you for listening to me talk about this course that has been so much fun to develop and so meaningful to be involved in. Um, I also want to thank Project TIER, the Sheffield Methods Institute, the UK Reproducibility Network. Um, I would love to hear from you. Um, continue this conversation. Um, my email address and web page are there. And also the course materials I've been talking about are available for you to use and adapt uh, at uh, the Open Science Framework. Thanks so much.